expect a ring. When you don't expect a reinforce, the sheep and goats linger together. But what happens? When the rain stops, the sheep and the goats will be separated. And now the rain has stopped. The umbrella that we're taking has been returned to its proper owner. And so the owners have received their umbrellas. The overnight rich people have become poor people. In fact, they have become beggars. The austere buildings have turned to mud houses. I tell you, the unexpected rain has subsided. Can't you see what I'm talking about? Don't you understand what I'm talking about? The unexpected rain has stopped. Everything has changed. Listen to me, my people. Everything has changed. The rural lions have turned to kittens. No one is afraid of them again. It has turned to kittens. It has become the toy of the children living in a house. Yeah, my people. Everything has changed. The book constructor can no longer funk out the swap. So now today, that's also right they can eat. They can't funk out anymore. That's also right they can eat too. Yeah, my people, everything has changed. Look at the cobra, it is no more poisonous. It has become the toy for the children today. It has no more thing, it has become the toy. It has no more poison, it has become a toy. I am very, very surprised. Everything has changed. Life can change you. Life can change you. Life can change my people. Life can change you. Say to a child, and may life do change you. That baboon today taking by him beauty pageant. That baboon today taking by him beauty pageant. Why we all want to be policemen today? We bring in peace in the section. You are policemen today. I say, look at me. Everything has changed you. I'm so surprised. Everything has changed. Oh, the leopard today carry reindeer to school. They say, be careful, my friend, before you hurt yourself. I'm very surprised. Everything has changed. If men like a leopard can carry deer to school and be so friendly with women, everything has changed you. Situation, I'm waiting to change. Look, what I wear there, that's a big day you want. Everybody get our own era. <laughs> that is the for it. This is the AP Johnson. Some people got a hero to me. Your hero is your hero. My hero is my hero. They call a hero.
Mary son of the time I shot my eyes Oh God, you know Senator and other leaders of our country, to discuss and reason together, reason about things that will bring peace and reconciliation to our country. We invoke your presence, and that's how you be with us always, so that whatever we say and do may be to your honor and to your glory, and for the service of your people, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 I'm welcome, Mars, by the President of the Liberian Association of Metropolitan Atlanta, Madam Sue Yancey Williams. After 14 years of civil conflict, we are pleased that Atlanta was among 
the city is chosen by, by Minister Samokai during his official tour in the United States. As you may already know, Honorable Chair Brani, Samokai is Liberia's Minister of Defense and he is on an official visit to the United States. During his stay, he has declared <coughs> and he has decided to visit a number of Liberian communities during which Liberians in those lighter cities will be able to ask the minister about current developments on the ground in Liberia. No doubt, as the Minister of Defense, Mr. Kamka, Mr. Mr. Samaka will be one of the key uh, players in maintaining peace and stability in our country after the United Nations military mission unit ends its tour of duty. So, it is very important that we have serious discussion with the minister about peace and security in Liberia. That is the purpose for this gathering. Some of the questions that we would like for the Minister of Defense to address include, which, what action of plan does the government intend to put in place that would ease the concern of many Liberians about sustaining peace and stability in Liberia when unit mail leaves? Can the minister assure us that Liberia will not fall back into chaos after the UN peacekeeper keeping force leaves? I am sure there will be many other questions by the audience. Finally, let me take this time to thank Ambassador Minor and Minister Samakai for meeting with us and to assure them that we are confident President Sali will continue to provide strong and dynamic leadership. We are praying for Paul and all those who strive to make peace, to make Liberia a better place. So, Mr. Ambassador, on behalf of the Liberian Association of Metropolitan Atlanta, LAMA, it is indeed an honor and privilege for me to welcome you and other distinguished guests to the city of Atlanta. Thank you. Program, you see, we have the recognition of guests later on the program, so I will leave that for the Council General to do at the appropriate time, and so that's why we are not going to up to this time. Right now, we have remarks from His Excellency Honorable Charles A. Minor, a U.S. Ambassador to the United States of America. Madam President, Madam President, Mr. Council General, Mr. Honorable the Minister, Distinguished Senator, the Assistant Minister, I see in the audience some very familiar faces, both from Captain Center, Mr. Moore, who has graciously, where is he? Oh, yeah, he's taking picture. This is, and indeed, I am very pleased to come. This is one of the places that is high on our agenda for activities, and it is the hub of Southern United States. So, in our activities to come to the south of this country, Atlanta is where the action takes place. Let me tell you that uh, the president has been extremely concerned about the Liberians in the diaspora, in particular the Liberians in the United States. Uh, we all recognize that it is in these United States that we've had solution to problems in Liberia and we have had the creation, the difficulties, and the problems that Liberia encounter all grow here in these United States. And we all know that. My task as the representative of our government is to make sure I don't deal only with the U.S. government, and that takes a huge amount of my time, but also deal as much as I can with the Liberian community throughout the country. What of you are making sure that they constitute themselves as part of the rebuilding of our country, although they are at a distance. Now, i tell you a few things concerning this sort of work that we do with the Liberian community. If we're looking at peace and stability in our country, in my opinion, there are two basic issues that we have to always address. 
And one of them, the minister will address that issue, and that is the physical presence of having people boots on the ground to maintain the peace. But the other side of peacekeeping and peace maintaining is the economy, enabling people to have jobs, to be able to send their children to school, to be able to have places to, to go when they're ill and get treatment. And if you can keep those two in balance, then there is a great possibility that peace can be sustained. But if you have only troops on the ground and the people are hungry, and somebody throws a stone at a shop and the doors are broken, what do you think will happen? Everybody hungry will rush there and take what they can take to go feed their family. So it's critical really to work and keep between this balance for the sustenance of peace in Liberia and for its growth and development. So we're very actively involved in this. One of the points I'd like to raise is that we here in the United States, of Liberians in the United States, constitute the most important component of the Liberia's middle class. We have the most educated among Liberians anywhere. We have the most talented, the most experienced, the ones who make the most money. And secondly, we've got to maintain a good relation with the Liberians in this country for those reasons. The other day, we at the embassy had to quickly run with Eula to go to the uh, Capitol Hill and talk about the possibility of not sending Liberians back on or before September 10th yet when TP has expired. Uh, one of the things I had to prove to them is that we want to retain Liberians here as long as we can who are working with the view to help them continue to earn their living and remit to Liberia. And my calculation, based on the information I got from the National Bank or the Central Bank of Monrovia, is that Liberians in America remit $6 million a month for the last 15 months since President Sully has been in power. $6 million. Now, where will Liberia get that money? We can't borrow money. Our revenue base is very low. So it is critical for us here to know the role that we are playing and for us in government to ensure that government appreciates the role of Liberians in the diaspora today to help our country. Now, what we've been doing in the, next, in the last few months is also not just that, but saying to Liberians, yes, we would like you to come, but not rush to come, come at your pace, but most so we want Liberians who can come and start businesses and get involved in employing Liberians so that the large, the 70 odd percentage of Liberians unemployed can begin to get jobs. So our agenda is huge, and we cannot do it alone. So from time to time, we are anxious to get our ministers to come over. We asked them to come, and when they came in February, we had planned a program. Unfortunately, we couldn't keep them because other demands required that they leave. So we made a special request to the President that the Minister of Information the Minister of Defense, in particular, those two come. The Minister of Information, unfortunately, is on his way. He called me from Accra, and he's not going to be here, but he'll be here as of tomorrow. Actually, I think he's arriving tonight. So that the Liberian and the diaspora can get to know what is happening on the ground in Monrovia, <clears throat> so that you can develop a sense of, of belonging and participate in what is happening, so that we together can build our country. There's a tendency in Liberia amongst the people who stayed there and felt the brunt of the hardship to feel that they suffered and those of us abroad were enjoying. And therefore, when the situation improved, they should be the one to benefit. We've got to let them know that we too were suffering yeah. <laughs> and that we share responsibility to the improvement of this country as much as they and that we will go and join them and help to develop our country. So we're going to work together. So we're going to work together. And that is why, you know, the government is making every effort to inform you, to involve you, and to help that we together, the government and the people, will work to improve the better our country. The President and I were together as late as 12 o'clock last night, University, Langston University in Oklahoma, 
uh, to go to New York and to, uh, I think, uh, New Jersey. But she will be back in Atlanta on Sunday to speak as Spellman. You know, people criticize the prior. Why is she traveling so much? Somebody referred to her as the traveling flying nun. nun. The flying nun. The flying nun. But I tell you, <laughs> honestly, <laughs> it is a burden and it's a great responsibility on our shoulders at the embassy for trying to find it frequently. But the results are phenomenal. Let me just tell you what happened in Atlanta. We've decided that when the president visits a place and makes a speech, that's not for nothing. Something must be done for the betterment of Liberia. And we were able to negotiate a memorandum of understanding that offers five scholarships to Liberians for four years at $20,000 a year. And if you calculate that, one person for $100,000 for five years, five people, I mean for four years, five people. That was a visit of a president. That's the sort of strategy we have to use because today we cannot borrow money. We have a debt burden of $3.7 billion and we can't borrow from anybody. So we've got to actually ask people to give us grant, find ways in which to help us meet the objectives we need to rebuild our roads, build schools, hospitals, etc. During the time that the president is and the next one, she will spend time raising money for the Liberia Education Trust. She was in New York night before the last and raised substantial contribution. And there will be another meeting on the 15th in Washington where I think Mrs. Uh, Clinton will appear with her. And the intention is to raise enough money to help the Liberia Education Trust build 50 new schools, train 500 teachers and give scholarship to 5,000 women. Now, she can sit down in Liberia and be the sitting nun in most parts of the So, I mean, that's part of our task and our responsibility. I will start talking because we've got some other distinguished people who can tell you more. So I'd like to say, to all of those who helped to organize this, thanks very much. We appreciate the effort that the association is making. And I'd like to tell you that we're planning to have an investment symposium in Atlanta in a few months' time, after the budget is passed, so we can bring in some more ministers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Harris. We go to Liberia, we have a saying, saying we're on the ground. So we got somebody from the ground who's in the trenches, politically elected, at the will of the people. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome a member of the Liberian Congress, Honorable Lahaz Lasana, Senator from Bowman County. Let me just add in, I was born at LMC Hospital in 1964. <laughs> <laughs> Madam President, Mr. Vice President, Mr. Ambassador, the Minister of National Defense, Dr. Young, Assistant Minister, distinguished librarians, and all are invited. I'm very pleased to be part of this town hall meeting. Even though I was informed by the president, we arrived in New York. So, Mr. Senator, I'm going to call Ambassador Romano to join the Defense Minister Ambassador Pitt in the town hall meeting. I'm the chairman, I chair the Committee of National Defense and the Senate. And I know from our discussion, the librarians are concerned about the severe situation. That we, you know, I wanted the Defense Minister to speak before I come in, but we have to follow the protocol. And you people elected her. So by your will, I will speak. Yeah. Uh, The Minister of Defense and the Senate working together to make sure that we are not protected. And uh, I want to take this time to also inform you people that under this regime, there will be no security harassment. You are free to enter the You are free to go to do business. I want to show you that this government 
not being harassed. Come into consideration. Who has a bad citizen, respect the law, the law will respect it. We will not hand to respect our citizen. The Senate will not sit see citizen, innocent citizen in a rise by any secular man. That will not happen under this region. Why we were elected by you people. And this is why I agree with the ambassador. I want you people to go and invest in media. I want you people to go and invest in bombing county. Because bombing county is one of the countries that are producing water. You can drink safe water from bombing county. Mineral water. I don't want to stretch too much on the security because I want what people tell you and what people will say, this is why we will react on. We have bills from the different ministry. They are there. They are in committee room. I see why the president says you come. Because from your comments, we we'll know how the bill will be acted into law. What we need to take from there, we'll take it from there. What we need to add there to protect our people will be added. What will create problems for our people. Will delete it. There's a minister I'm sitting in front. We will take it out because we want Liberia to change. And today, the freedom in Liberia, I don't think other past government Liberia enjoy me. If even the water is unsafe, you carry Liberia. The next day you hear what radio. The 15 year old child will call. Uh, the Liberian in America send water that water not safe, so we're against our water. <laughs> you carry back. So the freedom of speech in Liberia is not something easy. Even you know, the ambassador will pass a financial bill from the Senate. We want more money. The Liberian people say, no, 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 that bill can't. The president shouldn't pass that bill. This is how we do it, because the demand of the people. So Liberia is free. I don't want to go in detail. I'm waiting for the minister. Answer, question and answer that will come in. Because I can purposely get from you people. What is your contribution to this government? How do you want the government to work? The government is for the people, and the people control the government. But this is an election. We're not here big election. We're not here big senator. The president was duly elected by you people. I know you people were campaigning for some of but I'm talking to your people. Not for me, citizen there. We talk to you, for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I know many of you talk, you know, talk to your friend. You vote for Ellie to listen to you people. And now what we will tell you people. But what you people will tell us, there's an instrument we will use to guide you people. God bless you. At this time, we will call first at the Liberian Embassy to introduce our own guest speaker. Uh, Senior Senator for Bomb for Bombay County, Honorable Lai Langsana, uh, Minister of Defense, Brownie J. Samukai Jr., Assistant Minister, South Bama. Uh, Honorary Council, Butter Young, uh, all of our Liberian people and our other guests are here today. Uh, this man we want to introduce to you. We are not about to introduce him. We are introducing him to you. He is old. One of the youngest defense minister to ever be appointed in that country. You know, this government is a different government. Positively different. On the government, you have so many women in the cabinet. The only government, you have so many young men in the government. The only government that has people from every county and every district represented. So that's what makes it positively different. This minister is a married man. <laughs> he has seven children. So he finished like it. He has lived almost all of his life defending the country Liberia. After he had his first degree from the University of Liberia, he won the Fulbright Scholarship to come as a fellow to study for his master's. Like some other people, after your studies, you will decide to stay here and work at small. But he went back in the military, and at the same time, he was teaching at the University of Liberia. 
He was there teaching several subjects. And there is another talent that he has. So when we say he can defend your country, he can defend you. <laughs> when all the weapons fail, he will stand and lead the people. Our minister, as he didn't want to be the only strong man, he decided to establish a series of karate classes that students were practicing. Other people did not like it. They said he wanted to establish a new army. But that's not it. He wanted to make sure that Liberia is always defended. In 1990, 91, 92, when we had the interim government headed by uh, President Abel Sawyer, Mr. Brownie Samaka, after the MPFL, wanted to wreak havoc on our people in Monrovia to overrun the capital. He and his colleagues, in collaboration with ECOMOG and the government, immediately and swiftly organized a group they called Black Beret. In just a few weeks, at maximum competence, and returned to Monrovia, and they were able to subdue, protect, defend, to make sure that MPFL never took over Monrovia. And instead of just protecting, they made sure they gave them what we call maximum distance from the capital. And with that record he had, he led a group they called the Black Beret has ever come out. Black Beret came out at the time they trained them and came. When they finished with that assignment, the next time they came out was when we had the say General Chulu now run into the mansion and say he finished taking over government. They said, no, Black Beret got to come in. In less than one day, Black Beret came along with Echo Moore. How Drew left the mansion, we know. Well, he said, we'll tell his story. <laughs> but Mr. Samukai left government. He found a door with the United Nations on good assignment, making good money. He decided to come back again to ask to reform the Liberian security system. When we say the security system, we are saying that he's Minister of Defense, but he's not only for defense. Because defending the country is not only the soldiers. We have the police, we have the immigration, we have the SS and all of them. So the security sector reform, he is the main brain behind it. So when he stands here today to tell you that Liberia is safe, that tomorrow you're not going to stand on brush with your cell phone, somebody slap you and take your cell phone from you, because no, he's not lying to you. So we, before I tell you everything, he will just tell you what he's been doing. But ladies and gentlemen, Honorable Samukai, Mr. Samukai. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you just have to be relaxed. You will do what a job for you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Minister Councilor, Excellency, the Ambassador, uh, Honorable Senator, uh, Minister, uh, Minister Saul Obama, Honorable Council General Dr. Young, President and officials of the Liberian community, Bishop Kula, along with Liberia, who are here today. Liberia, Liberians who are also here, who have come. Friends, I'm very glad to be here this uh, afternoon to share with you some of what we understand is happening back out of in our country as it relates to the security of our country. So first of all, I'd like to apologize for not coming the last time when the, the ambassador and his team organize vigorously and mobilize Liberians to also come and exchange and discuss some ideas. Uh, it was a regret because I had to run back to East Africa immediately for a follow-up meeting in that part of our country. But this time around, the president ensured that I was going to make sure uh, that I participate according to the plans as the embassy have outlined. We'd like to the, uh, the Council General and the Liberian Association for the hospitality we received thus far, and it's very much appreciated. It is true that uh, I do have seven children. As a matter of fact, one of my daughters here, uh, Michelle Pisa. Yeah. And I'd like to say happy Mother Day to all the mothers that are here. Thank yeah. you. Um, where do I begin? But let me say that security is all of us concerned, and it goes back not just today, not just in 2003, but if you may recall, it goes back to the work of those men 
that people, men and women, that people have forgotten about so soon. And that is the Interfaith Mediation Committee coming out of the Banju Conference in 1990. That committee put out in its discussions in Monrovia, Freetown, and Banju, which laid the basis for all the agreements and subsequent agreements up to the 2003 peace agreement, which called for the restructuring of the armed forces of Liberia and all security institutions. That portion of that, those wise men and women step in, remain consistent throughout the years, throughout all agreements, whether it is the Yamasoko series, whether it is the Geneva clarification, what is the Cotonou Accord, what is the Abuja Accord, and subsequently the election of 1997, followed by uh, the call in 2003, it remained consistent, the restructuring of the armed forces of Liberia and all security agencies. Now the basis of that varies, whether it was lack of confidence, whether it was because of the conduct of those institutions, or whether because of the leadership or the composition, there was an overwhelming agreement and consensus on the need for the restructuring of the armed forces of Liberia and all police and military and security institutions. The question therefore was, having signed the agreement in 2003, what approach would the government adopt, what approach would the international community adopt in order to go through the restructuring process? Because for every successive government that came through, whether it was interim government or the previous government, they brought in additional personnel. And when they were leaving, they left those personnel behind. But the personnel that we're bringing in were all personnel, not necessarily representing the interests of, the, of every library, but rather representing the interests of those persons or groups that brought them into the various institutions. So it made it very difficult for you to single out someone from that group as to why that person should not remain in the organization. So the question was, what approach would be adopted in order for this process to proceed? So the process began immediately after the uh, transitional government under the NTG order came in with our international partners to set up, to do a re-documentation of all of the persons in the military, all of the persons in the police, all of the persons in the immigration services, and other security institutions. This re-documentation will allow you to understand the composition of the group, the years they have served in the institution, the kind of assignments they had, the kind of ranks that they had, and the cost implication if you are supposed to take any of the process leading to a retirement or severance and provide whatever benefits. There are several approaches that are out there, but there's no real clear-cut uh, single solution that fit every country. So the question was, what do we do? For the Force of Liberia, the institution had a major credibility problem. A credibility problem that dated back during the, war, the years of the military coup, running to the war years up to the time peace came in 2003. You could have done two approaches. You could have gone to what they call lustration. It's a process that allows you to look at the institution and then single out a person who you believe don't fit into the institution and then retrain the others that will remain in the organization and then proceed from. But with the efforts of library, it would have been extremely difficult to single out persons because there have been successive groups and that systems, with all system processes and procedures through which you could come in. The criteria for selection was not clearly defined. Those who brought this person in for whatever purpose could not be easily removed because they were already into the government. So it was generally agreed that the entire institution should be vetted, meaning they should provide everyone with the severance payments and grant everyone the opportunity to come back. But in order to come back, you have to meet certain standards, certain criteria. And that vetting process had to ensure that the credibility of those coming in would be unquestionable to the armed of Liberia. That the entire institution was vetted. The entire institution was put through a scrutiny. The entire institution was given the opportunity to come back. But having received your payments, that is, they provided you with, um, depending on the years of service, depending on the military, they were receiving uh, payments. But there were two groups. You have the regular soldiers that have been in the army long before the war. And you have those who were conscripted and mobilized to fight alongside the government after 1990, or after 1989 conflict. So one has to make a distinction between those who were active to the soldiers and those who were mobilized to the army. That's when you call secret service. Similarly in the Liberian National Police. One had to distinguish those regular police officers who have always been policemen 
gone to the academy in training, and those who are brought in and given police uniforms, or those who are brought into the Secret Service or the SSS to protect successive presidents, successive interim governments. So for the armed forces of Liberia, that distinction was clear. You had those who were into the military long before the military conflict into 1990, and those were conscripted as of 1990 to the end of 2003. So the severance payment that was provided to these individuals varies. The regular army received anywhere from 750 US dollars um, for the term of service to about 4,000 United States dollars, 4,000 plus United States dollars for the service that they may have rendered the country. So in US own valuation, that's a very small money. But in Liberian standards, that is a lot of money for the amount of service. But take the law. The 1956 Act, which governed the armed forces of Liberia or the Liberian National Guard then, provides that the individual receives 16 and 2 third percent of their last salary that they were receiving. If you follow that, what the law says, you would have been paying them only, and I repeat, only four United States dollar minimum to a maximum of about 65 US dollar minimum. <laughs> so the government chose not to go with that part of the law, rather to observe what the law says and add it on to that. So the United States government, along with the government of South Africa, and a little token contribution by the government, have paid out up to date over 20 million United States dollars to the armed forces of Liberia, to the special security services, and it took the generosity of the British government, who provided the uh, two point, I think it was like 2.8 million dollars, amounting to about uh, three, 3.1 million United States dollars to pay off the police personnel who were retired. The process to begin the restructuring. And that is exactly what happened. But did it end there? No, it did not. No sooner had the payment continued, we had 400 persons, which I'm sure you heard of in 2006, demanding to be paid by the government. That they were not documented, therefore they needed to be paid. The question was, but where were you in these uh, two years when all of the announcements and posters and advertisement information was provided for you to come to be redocumented? Some of the answers range from our in the refugee camps to, our, to my last assignment, for example, in areas like Vahun, where the roads from Vahun to Monrovia are highly palatable. It was not possible for you to pass on those roads. Mm -hmm. So looking at all of those reasons, it was difficult to determine whether, in fact, these were actual soldiers that were in the military. There were no records. <coughs> so in the end, a political solution was found. But that was found only after a demonstration uh, when they failed to accept what the government was offering and went on a rampage on April 26, 2006. I'm sure you probably heard how the, uh, the true bizarre of the Minister of Defense, I was in the office, I was having a meeting that morning, I knew what was going on, and it just got angry and started burning tires and threw a lot of missiles out of the building. Well, others in the past used to flee, but we did not. We said we still wanted to engage and have a dialogue. At the end of the missile house, on mill was able to, the United Nations forces were able to remove those personnel, and we came downstairs with journalists and showed them the damage and called to ask, is this a way to find a solution to a problem? So the government ordered the arrest of those individuals for act of violence, and through, um, after apology, through the intervention, once again, of the Liberal Council of Churches, uh, a solution was found. And those persons were not prosecuted, but they were forgiven and told that dialogue is the best way to go and not violence. So we came a long way since all of the agreements of 1990 as they approached to adopt the methodology to follow. The institutions were really having a major credibility problem. So that was what we decided in terms of vetting, and that process is continuing up to today. But how do you restructure the institutions? What do you do now? Now that you come to the vetting and pay up everyone, what is the approach that you're going to take to move forward? Well, there are civilian administrators in the Ministry of Defense. Once again, the generosity of the American people came in and they retrained 91 persons out of 400 persons that were in the Ministry of Defense. We came and cut down the staff from a 400 level to 91 professional staff. And we gave them uh, 15 weeks of professional training to the U.S. military, they are retired military officers, Booking and provided specialty training, specialty training in finance, in logistics, in acquisition, in, in uh, public affairs, legal affairs, human resources, personnel management, pretty much that which is needed in order to make the Minister of Defense more functional. 
So out of 130 persons, we hire 91 staff with about 23 support staff, drivers, mechanics, custodians, that are personally helping to run the Ministry of Defense. The question is that with all of this investment, why is it we stay hearing that only a few persons have been trained? Indeed, since the recruitment process began after the inauguration on January 16th, about 8,000 persons or more have gone through the vetting process to the application to join the new military. But only about 12% have been able to meet the standards that we have set, which is a very tall order. <laughs> the standard is that you must be a high school graduate to join the military, and if you want to be a future officer, you must be a college graduate in order to become a standard. <laughs> that standard is up there, and we do have applicants. As a matter of fact, the president has ordered me to ensure now, that I seek 20% composition of that full structure. Very tough order, we are fluctuating between 3 and 7%. But I can assure you that those numbers are better and it will improve as time goes on. Um, so we have completed 105 graduates since July 22nd, 2006 when the recruits started training. And up to uh, last week, Tuesday, up to the 8th of May, 2007, nine of 11 officers, first new officers of the Armed Forces of Liberia were commissioned by the President. And we had the entire international community there. Uh, and I must tell you that out of the nine, one of them is a lady who was a college graduate as well. <laughs> Liberian acts, how do we ensure that we don't have ethnic dominance? That one group of people dominate to, to make sure that recruitment is across the board throughout the country. Everyone that has the opportunity, everyone that has a willingness can come to join the military. And that was exactly what happened. The same thing with the police. Anyone can go and join, but you must meet the standards. The same thing with the SSF, which is still ongoing restructuring. So what we try to do is to make sure that uh, everyone has a fair share in joining, but at the same time, you know, into the system, and the system is advised that know that this composition of 500, no single group should dominate beyond 16% for an example. So the computer generates a clear representation of all of the ethnic groups in the country, ranging from 1% to a maximum of 16%. So that is what we have. But that also reflects what librarian interest has always been. For an example, the day tribe, which is a very small tribe, and the VAR tribe usually don't like to join the military. They like other <coughs> fields. But you probably have persons from Lofa County and Bond County who love to be military personnel, so those numbers are up. But a new interesting thing is that Grand Bassa County, for quite interesting reason, are also part of the double digit of the new composition of the army. Let's go as a bomb, let's go as a lofa. But the two um, antagonists, if I will put it that way, in the 1990 conflict, the Nimba and the Crowns have shown very, very, very less interest in wanting to come back to join the military. For whatever reason, we believe that it is clear that they understand why. It may take some time for them to have the confidence in order to come back. So everything looks good. And then the widows came out and said, ah, you have paid those men. You haven't paid us. Our husband died during the war. They must give us our own salary and benefits. <laughs> well, we say, but man, didn't you get insurance payment? No, 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 no. That's a different money. We're talking about this money you are dividing now. So. Transitional government didn't listen. The market women, uh, those widows, when they strategized. And on this day, it was, on a, it was around about 10, 30, 11, 11, 30. You see a couple of women walk down to an intersection and wait. The other one walked this, but nobody was taking notice. We go this way and wait all over town. Just about lunch hour, when everybody's rushing out, the ladies blocked the entire city of one <laughs> Great lot. You couldn't move. No vehicles could move. Everybody was wondering, but why, the whole, why you can't move? They said, ah, the women see how she paid them their money. <laughs> now, who would have been brave in Liberia to get removed those ladies? Oh, so everybody started to try to find a solution and negotiate. It caught the attention of not only Liberians, but also the international community. It was on BBC. The next thing you look, the eve of election and the inauguration was the following weekend. Yeah. It was the following weekend. So the ladies were smart in the strategy they adapted. The government was compelled to find a solution that day. <laughs> made a promise and made a commitment. Even the president-elect had to come out in the street 
to convince and talk to these ladies. And it was not until late evening, around about 5.30 going to 6. And then all of a sudden, I don't know how the message went, but after the president and the ladies got the president elect and the ladies had the negotiation, they were talking about you know, 10 minutes, the women will leave the street. And indeed, in 10 minutes, everybody, goes. everybody had a sigh of relief. <sighs> <laughs> and eventually, we pay off the ladies, uh, give them some benefits, about $20,000, like dollars not a lot of money, but good enough to continue where they are. Was it finished? We thought it was. And they said, oh, no, 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 no. We got 30 more women you haven't paid. Now, how do you argue with you? You, you think, ah, they blocked the street the last time, and they were, they were this amount of prices, now 30. Ma'am, how, how much is the money? And then immediately we provided the payment. Then they said, oh, no, 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 there are five more prices for me. <laughs> so we are now processing the last five, and hopefully that will be the end. But I'm telling you how the process has been going, the difficulty that's involved. Now, we would have thought that at the end of that exercise, we got a widow started from 300 to 600 to 900, 1,008, eventually to 3,100. Now it's 3,130 that have been paid. We thought that was done. And then they said, oh, you know, um, but how do we manage our children? The money finish. What do, what do we need some benefits? They say, okay, we want to train you, capacity building, to learn to do sewing, tada, marketing, some skills. They said, the women agree. So we submitted a budget to the Honorable Legislature. The government did, and they approved. So we called the lady and said, okay, ma'am, great. The government has provided some money for funding. You have agreed on this training program. We're not ready to spend. We said, oh, okay, um, can we see you tomorrow, you know, a couple of days later? So a couple of days later, the women came. They said, Mr. Mr. Minister, we'd like to see the president. Oh. Why we want to, yes, you know, this training business, there's something we want to tell them. Somehow, we said, okay, we found a way on a weekend, on a Saturday, the ladies want to see the president. And I told the president, Madam President, you know, we thank you for everything you have done. Now you want us to go for training. But I'll be sitting there in the class, my child is hungry to the house. <laughs> <laughs> hungry. I will even concentrate on the instruction because I'm worried as to where we have food to eat. The president, but I took out the agreement and said, yeah, but we'll talk about it again. So what do you want? Now, what do you think they want? <laughs> so the president said, okay, look, I'll tell you what. Why don't you people go back to the minister and you'll sit down and have some discussion? So we actually increase the delegation. That's the composition of the delegation. And the person we need to see usually, they say, oh, you know, She's not too well. This one will be coming late. Oh, so what? Well, yeah. Oh no, these are the new, these are the same people. <laughs> <laughs> After the first five minutes, a security aide that is outside my door opened the door to find out what was happening inside the office. Because it was a very heated discussion. And the women put up one cry in the building. I mean, it was not easy. The women were crying. How their husband died. I mean, it, it went on and on, and I said, ma'am, you know, I'm so sorry. But honestly, I can't violate the law. I said, because the bill has gone to the Senate, they have authorized what needed to be done. By law, I can't change it, because this is what you requested, and this is what they approved. And we went into a lot of discussions. To cut a long matter short on that one, we discussed options as to what could be done. We tried to tell them how it is best to organize yourself in groups um, with some skills and be willingness to move on. We give them, for example, information that the World Bank has provided $7 million for the cleaning of Monrovia, drainage system and other places that needed to be cleaned They were going to be spending $7 million. Why don't the people apply as a group to want to perform certain services so that they can get paid as part of that money? Ah, that would be good. I see also, the World Bank is undertaking a lot of construction projects in the country. Why don't you organize yourselves and say, look, we're willing to do something like this or something like that. And see whether it will not give people the opportunity to go and try to do something. After those discussions and options, I think we, we are we on a, we on the path of finding a solution to the widow's problem. But that is an issue that could affect the stability of the country. And knowing the Liberian psyche of 
our women. You can't afford to be seen in the street beating a protester who happens to be a woman. Removing her from the street. I mean, you won't get any support from nobody. Even if the woman has done anything wrong, you will not. So you have to listen and try to find a way to discuss and negotiate. And that is what we have been trying to do. Unfortunately, in some instances, with the male counterparts who are ex-soldiers, it hasn't worked that well. And then you probably have heard some tensions. But now, they are happy to work with the Minister of Information uh, to find solutions to some of their issues and concerns. But to make it better, the government has submitted the following bills to the Honorable Liberian Senate as part of the restructuring process. We have submitted the, uh, the National Defense Act. Of course, we have withdrawn it for some corrections. But the National Defense Act is intended to replace the Act of 1956 to bring it up to modern standards to govern the new armed forces of my youth. Secondly, to take into consideration the, uh, those veterans and ex soldiers who have been retired, we have also prepared the National, I mean, the Bureau of Veteran Affairs Act. And I'm told that this a uh, couple of days ago, the debate on that act have started, or the hearings on that bill have started. It is hopeful with the passage of that bill, there will be the Veteran Affairs Office to advocate for the ex soldiers through an official channel and not necessarily by themselves. So the SSR process is ongoing. There are a few challenges. One of them is funding. We do not have the money to provide funding for the retraining of the Army or the police, immigration, or security services. Once again, with the generosity of the American people, we have gotten the support of the administration to do that. And I must say to you, just two days uh, before I mean, the day of my arrival, on Thursday, we finally had the administrator finally signing the funding for the continuation of the training of the Armed Forces of Liberia. So the next training will begin uh, most likely before the end of the month, hopefully, now that the funding bill has been signed by the administration. And that will allow for a continuation of the training of five, another 500, another 500, another 500. The figure of persons to be trained is 2,000. We did not choose the 2,000. That is, this government did not choose the 2,000. That was the legacy of the transition arrangements that was brought on to us. And by law, after that transition arrangement of 2,000 have been achieved, we cannot recruit any soldier into the new military and honor Article 34 until the Senate or the legislature that has the authority to mandate the executive to raise an army before further recruitment will take place beyond the 2,000 persons. So the Americans are working to complete up to complete the training of those 2,000 personnel. We do have the support of our international partners, uh, particularly the British, the Ghanaians, the Nigerians, and we have put all of that on a, what we call a defense support group. These are bilateral partners who meet on a quarterly basis to review all of the assistance needed to support the armed forces, and they decide on where their individual countries will contribute to those packages. Uh, and I think it's been very helpful. That next meeting is going to be next month in, uh, in June. Lastly, you should not see the restructuring and isolations per institution. Say, for example, you look at the police and say, ah, oh, the police are just 3,500 police for a three, 3 million population. Or you look at a quick reaction unit of 500 that's supposed to be formed. Or you look at a 2,000 person military and say it's not enough to protect our entire country. But we'd like you to see it not within the context of an individual group or entity, but rather within a global context. Taking that to be that it is that global context that will provide entire safety and security for the country, look at the constitutional responsibilities or the statutory responsibilities for these groups. Say, for an example, the police of 3,500 on the issue of law enforcement. But there's a quick reaction element added to that that will have a paramilitary function, like a SWAT group, to deal with arm related uh, offenses, to deal with acts of terrorism, uh, to deal with widespread riots or demonstrations leading to violence or arm related incidences. So you don't have to use the military, you can use that small quick reaction element in order to respond to that. So if you look at the entire architect, the police will therefore comprise about 50% of the full structure for maintaining security in the country. The next 25% will fall to the statute to the armed forces of Liberia of 2,000 personnel. Now you're going to say, but well, Mr. Minister, 2,000 is not enough. Well, the question I ask you is, how are you defining the threat for the country that 2,000 is not enough? So we say, although it may not be enough to carry on all of the exercises, but it will be complemented by this architectural 
security architecture we're talking about, comprising the police for law enforcement, comprising the immigration services and customs that will serve as early warning to the government. The same thing with the intelligence institution to provide early warning as well to the government. And the military will be there to protect the territorial integrity of the country and not worrying about law enforcement functions in the country. So we want to see it within a global architect and not just a narrow figure of 2,000, but within the whole context uh, under the security sector reform program. If that were to take place and support it, it will be best for all of us, not only as Liberians, but also our international partners. Because if you support only the police or only the military, you have three other vacuums that you leave out. You probably be leaving out about 25%, which will make the situation a little bit more vulnerable. So we are working along with the United Nations on their CDW, meaning Consolidation Drawdown Withdrawal, in Liberia's own CRD, that is Consolidation Review and Deployment, to compensate each other so that when all milk eventually begins to draw down a couple of years from now, our capacity would have been built and we will be able to take over. Would that provide the security assurances that Liberians need? It may not. So we intend to ensure that there's regional understanding that will provide regional security for our people in our country. And that is where we'd like to let you know that the government of Liberia have expressed interest in the U.S. intent to have the African command created somewhere in Africa. Liberia may not have the facilities. We may not have the generation of power. We may not have all of the infrastructure that is needed to host what is a small or a large segment of the Africa. But there is one thing Liberia has that the others have not had. There is one thing that Liberia has always had with the United States, and that is the historical relationship between our two countries and two people. A relationship that Liberia has proven its friendship in protecting the U.S. strategic interests during the Cold War time. Liberia has proven its friendship and relationship with the American people even during World War II, when our President Roberts International Airport serve as a refueling and billeting facility for the United, United Military uh, Services. And at the same time, there, there were certain strategic facilities that it, the United States needed in Africa, and there was only one country that was willing to host those facilities, and that was Liberia. So Liberia offered to the American people its generosity, its friendship, its openness, and the political world. Come on in as Africa, and you have the best reception you can find. Before I take my seat, I'd like to say to you, I may not have provided all of the answers that you probably have been expecting, but I think by the question you asked and the engagement that we have will help us in that regard. The support and cooperation we have received from the Liberia legislature has been very helpful in helping the SSR program to continue. And also the support from the American people through your administration, through your government, through your NGOs has helped us to persevere. But also to the Liberians in the diaspora, the contribution you continue to make is very invaluable to our ability to keep hope alive. Many of you may have gone to Liberia in recent times, or may not have gone, or may have heard. If you remember EOWA coming towards the military facility, it used to be an empty field. Today, go and see. From your contribution, we have hundreds and hundreds of real estate coming up. That shows hope and confidence that people have and things will improve. We'd like to say thanks to you Liberians in the diaspora for such wonderful support you continue to provide. And we do hope, like the President said, that the U.S. Uh, will not be in a haste to send you back because if they send you back, it might be a humanitarian crisis. We have nowhere to put you. <laughs> the legislature is displaced. Now I say, when you come, all of us will be displaced. <laughs> I told out the minister information, except <laughs> you're talking about security, but the eloquent yes. thing, I mean, it's just well organized. Thank you, Jim, uh, Mr. Minister. Could you give me another round of applause? Yes. Uh, John Strindler, who's Vice President of Peace Program at the Carter Center. He's accompanied by his wife, Caroline. She's uh, is a trained statement to those who will come out. Uh, that's called Dr. Caroline uh, Strindler. We have Tom Craig, who I'm with for the terror, fourth time already. He's the assistant director and CM Political Analyst Center. We have Dr. Mike Best, 
Let us stand on this. Okay, yeah, probably. I'll start again. You stand. I think other folks here want to know you. Okay, I'm saying again. I'll start with Dr. John Strimler, the Vice President of Peace Programs. His wife, Dr. Carol Ryan Strimler, who's a student of that. And then we have Tom Craig, who's the Assistant Director and Senior yeah. Political Analyst. I'm with my mother. All right, and so my mother. <laughs> Tom is the uh, Assistant Director and Senior Political Analyst of Conflict Resolution at Carl Center. You have Dr. Mike Best, who is a professor at the Sam Long School of International Affairs from Georgia Tech. I guess you are very instrumental in the President's visit there, if I'm not mistaken. I know he was around. And Debbie ABE News, 90.1, also NPR, or Dead Yusef. We're going to go for a little press time afterwards, we don't begin. Okay, and of course, our TRC man, our Bishop, humble. Always with the talk, the Reverend Dr. Bishop Atukula. You're going to talk about TRC now. Okay, We're speaking briefly about TRC, and as our uh, MC said, after I've finished, then uh, you can ask me some question. One of the process of bringing peace, unity, and reconciliation to Liberia is the organization and the induction into office of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We are Nine persons, four women, and five men. Our job, according to our act, or according to the, the uh, act that brought us into Bay, is to promote peace, unity, reconciliation, and security to Liberia by one, investigating all human rights violations and violations of international human rights and then the abuses that took place during the war. Not only that, but we are to provide forum for both the perpetrators and the victims to come and exchange ideas with the hope of working on a process whereby there can be forgiveness and reconciliation in Liberia. Our job in doing that, as I said, is to promote peace reconciliation and unity for our country. Now to be able to do that, our commission has divided us into different sections and organized into different subcommittees. There's a subcommittee on the military working very hard to see what we can do to recommend to the government what we can do to improve and reorganize the military and improve the military. There's a subcommittee on judiciary. There's a subcommittee on education. There's a subcommittee on the security, the whole security system in the country. There's a, uh, 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 there's a subcommittee on the role of religious and traditional leaders during the peace process. I happen to be the chair of that subcommittee. I'm also chair of the subcommittee on uh, reconciliation and reunification. I'm also chair, a chairman of the subcommittee on fundraising. I appeal to all of you people who are in America to give us some money to be able to carry on the work of the TRC. The role of religious leaders and traditional leaders, that is a very important job because I'm a religious leader and one of the reasons why I was elected to go to TRC or nominated to go to the TRC is that I'm going to bring a religious flavor to TRC. In fact, the word reconciliation is a theological term. You don't find that in sociology. If it's in sociology, then they borrow it from, from theology, but it's a, it's a theological term. And so my job has been and will continue to be to have uh, consultation with religious leaders, traditional leaders throughout Liberia to be able to find out what we can do to bring peace to Liberia so that we'll never have war again. There is in Liberia a traditional form of reconciliation. If you go in any of our villages, there's a process of confession, there's a process of claiming what you have done, and there's a process of forgiveness where you can start with the individual, you go on the community level, and of course on the county level. We are going to take some of those and recommend to the government in order to use that to bring peace and reconciliation to Liberia. One of the, the traditional one is peace festival. If you go in any village, especially during the holidays, you see people are dancing, coming from different villages, working together, we are going to recommend that. And so that's one thing I'm going to do. My committee is doing. We are going all over the country have a consultation, after the consultation, then we are going to have seminar, town hall meeting just like this, where we discuss, and then delegates from there will come together, we'll have a big conference, and then resolution from there will be sent to the TRC, 
and that the resolution will be sent to our government for work so that there will be peace in our country. The next uh, subcommittee that I'm working on is a subcommittee on uh, reconciliation and unity in our country. And in doing that, we are going to go all through the country again having hearings, hearing from one county to the other. In fact, we are dividing the country into eight zones. We're having hearings all over the country, and then from there, we are going to again recommend to the government. But the important thing we're going to do since the war is to establish a fund for reparation. There will be individual reparation, community reparation funds, and national reparation funds. Individual. There are people whose limbs were cut, people whose eyes were clogged, women who were raped, they need attention. There will be funds recommended to the government to take care of that, to take care of those people. Then there are community reparation that has to do with schools, hospitals, clinics, housing, and so forth. There is a national uh, uh, reconciliation and reparation. We pray and hope that at the end, there's going to be a reparation for set aside. In fact, we start with a whole country mourning. You know, we Liberians are good in mourning. There's a period when the uh, 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 ladies' husband died. There is a period of mourning for six months to maybe a year or two, where the lady is supposed to uh, steal herself from the lady both, it's a both the men and the women. I don't know about, but I know about the women. But they are staying from all kinds of things until that period is over. And there's a special uh, service for that. We're going to have the same in Liberia, where we're going to have a special service, special money period, where we're going to exhume the bodies and rebury the bodies. We hope and pray that will be done. And then we'll have a money period. At the end of the money period, we we'll recommend to the president to, to um, uh, uh, apologize to the whole nation on behalf of all of us. Not because she was personally responsible for what happened, but because as a leader, she claimed responsibility for what has happened. So those are some of the things that we are going to do in that period of reparation, establishing reparation for the whole country. The last one is fundraising. We have had some ups and downs with respect to funds. Our government has been able to come forward with some funds for reconciliation, I mean for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but the funds are not being sufficient. Our partners, our international partners, have come forward with some forms, and now we have working relationship, very good working relationship. We pray that whole that's going to improve. And so, but partners to give us money without we ourselves doing that. So we are asking all of you, all of you, to give us money to be able to do that. Now, on the on the part of raising money, before I came as a chairman of the subcommittee on the role of religious leaders and traditional leaders. I wrote a letter to all the churches, all the bishops in Liberia, to take a Sunday aside that will be considered TRC Sunday. And all the funds raised on that Sunday will come to TRC to help with the work. Our United Methodist Church, I say our United Methodist Church, I'm a former United Methodist Bishop. United Methodist Church has agreed that the month of the first Sunday in June will be TRC Sunday all over Liberia. I read it to Bishop Daniel, Bishop Harris, and all of them have agreed that each of them will select a Sunday in that church to emphasize TRC. And funds raised from there will be able to come. It will be good. Madam President, or oh, one Monday, whatever the day will be, one day, day in Atlanta or throughout Liberia, it will have dual members here, do that for the whole country and raise money and send it to TRC. It will be good. If it will help to bring peace and reconciliation to our country. Lastly, I want to end by saying to bring peace to our country, as the minister was saying, all of us will put our hands together. Because when Liberia is at peace, our children will go to school, our wives will be able to go and do what they want to do, the men will be able to look for jobs, and we will be able to go back to Liberia and live there as we used to, even better than we used to. Because as a Belief and root in Liberia will rise again. Thank you. Uh, I will serve as moderator. And please, we want to be time conscious. We want to have, we want everyone to have a chance to ask questions. Unless your follow up is absolutely essential, we will not allow follow ups. Or if, if we see the logic and the coherence in the follow up, of course, we will allow it. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we are saying no follow up. 
But if, the, if, if there's a need, we will allow it. Okay? And please indicate to whom your question is addressed. We expect most questions to go to the Honorable Minister because he has taking passport issues you want to talk about, Ambassador Mano, about. <laughs> or we want to ask the Senator about the blue, the blue lake up at the top of Bombay Mountains. I don't know. We want to address Bishop Kula. So please identify the speaker to whom your question is addressed. I know while we're burning up the question, I've got a comment and I may have to leave. But I want to say to all of us and to the distinguished gentlemen, I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you for the commitment. I was in Liberia, Mr. Minister, when, when the ladies blocked the streets. <laughs> and and, and I, I, I stood there in tears because of the discipline that was demonstrated. Yes. No women was pulled off the streets. And, and I cried because that was the Liberia that I hope to start to see again. So I want to say thank you for that discipline. And this serve as the resident engineer at the fifth home where you managing the construction efforts there. I do have the intent to come home and participate as the ambassador. Love you. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you just the honorable minister? Mr. Semper, I just returned from Liberia last month working on my paper. And I am aware of the extensive vetting process that's done by DynCorp. But the Liberian people still don't seem satisfied. They complain that the army is full of Madingos and not Liberians. And also that they feel as if the education requirement is too high, that is Western standards and that because of the war, many people didn't have access to a high school education. How do you respond to that? Yeah, you get it. Yeah, you get it. Are you the minister? <laughs> I just want to make sure that uh, I'm following the program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, thank you. Jenny was in Liberia, and I did see her. And I granted her, I think, almost an hour and a half of interview. And uh, I would have hoped that she would have come back with this new element on the, on the ethnic side. The truth is, it is not true. Uh, Madingos uh, are just one segment uh, that is in the military, and they are less than 3%. And the statistics are very clear. And even those numbers are coming only from one sector of the country, and that is the Banjumak, where many of them are predominantly based, and it's also spread towards Banga as well, where they are. So they are not. But I can, I can tell you one thing, that if the concern is about an ethnic group dominance, I can assure you that we would not have that. It is not possible for one group to dominate because that has been clearly what Dr. Kesari started in 1991 on the issue of restructuring the armed forces of Liberia to ensure that there is clear geographic representation. We may not have geographic balance because it's not compelled, it's not a compulsion to have people to join the military, saying it is voluntary, but we'll ensure that there is adequate representation so that one group does not dominate either in terms of numbers, in terms of assignment, or in terms of rank. So that is one guarantee I want, to, I want to give you. On the issue of the education requirement, there is clear evidence of what has been tried and tested. In the 1960s, when the US government was bringing Liberians uh, to the states to be retrained, on, either under the Trainers of Trainers program or under the MTT military training team that went to Liberia, high school graduates were seen as a top leadership for the military. And those who couldn't even speak English up to those who had primary education and secondary will also consider as recruits into the army. But as the years went by and as the economy developed and cost of living increased, those who have entered the army with or without education were demanding ranks in order to get salaries. <clears throat> so those ranks were growing not in a professional sense, but more on the economic side. Before any corresponding benefit or qualification to the terms with the table organization and equipment of the army. That went through until the 1980s, and what happened subsequently? There was a big boom of everybody joining the military. Whether you had the minimum standard or not, everybody was brought in. You had uh, senior officers who couldn't read and write. You have senior officers who had later chance of being further trained in the States or getting advanced studies. And only high school students were being considered. It took uh, General Kofa, I think he's here in the States now, retired General Kofa, uh, the late uh, General Brapo, the late Maxwell Weir, the late Major Jala. These are persons who sat at the end of the 1970s and said, look, we got to move away from the high school ROTC BWI program to begin to recruit college students now for the future officer corps of the Army. I am a beneficiary of that program. The director of the NSA is the direct beneficiary of that program. The former national security advisor in Liberia 
is also a beneficiary of those ideas brought in by the late retired, I mean, the retired General Kofa, that we need to bring in college students or need to bring in a program, what they call Army Student Training Program, to send them to college, to the university, get educated, and come back to join the military to serve as officers. And we took advantage of that and became. Having gone through the conflict, we have seen all of the benefits of having officers that are educated and well experienced. And we have seen all of the shortcomings associated with leadership that lack the minimum basic formal requirement to serve as commanders or future leaders of the military. So we drew the conclusion that we must set standards for persons to meet. And standards that people will be challenged to want to excel. Uh, because of the war, we have, been, we have had several interruptions. But at the same time, there have been others who have graduated and been able to move on. Others who have graduated and willing to volunteer to serve. We are not sure of people passing the minimum test. In the vetting process, when you are being vetted, the information must be true, true, and must be truthful throughout the process. We can't have drug uh, smokers coming to join the army. Unacceptable zero tolerance. Doesn't matter whether you have a high school or college degree, right. it's unacceptable. The place of narcotics in your system is a non starter. So, all of those are part of the failing requirements. That is why it's not just academic, but it's a vetting process. I'll give you one last example on the vetting. He was a good individual. He passed all of the tests, including the medical test, provided information on the document, and when it went for the vetting process, Unfortunately, he didn't share the information with the better half of the house. So the wife didn't know what he had put on the paper. <laughs> so they went and met the wife and, and said, uh, you know, ma'am, A, B, C, and D. She said, oh, yes, my husband checkpoint and we always have food. Mm. Really? So yeah, he always brought food. You know, you would take the food from the people and bring it and order for you to have plenty of food. <laughs> <laughs> so you see what we're talking about here. Yeah. So the information was taken and it went back to the, to the, the, the potential recruiter and said, look, you said here yeah, you didn't participate in the war, you didn't do anything. Is there anything else you want to tell us that you can remember to correct the situation? And he denied. And then they said, okay, we have information that you serve as commander for so and so and so and so location. This gentleman denied. So the vetting team had no alternative but not to recommend him. The issue is not to reject, but not to recommend the individual whose credibility does not obtain at the very beginning at such a voluntary state. So can we grant such a man the authority to hold weapons when we don't trust a simple statement? So that is where the issue of the standards are high. So if you are a high school student, the test is easier because it was, given, it was taken from ninth graders. You got original plan prior to the, this government coming in was eighth grade to high school. To join the army. We came and changed it and told our counterparts unacceptable. They said, Well, you will not have enough college graduates. I said, Ah, <coughs> every year we have over 2,000 persons graduating from about five or six universities in the country. How many officers do we need in the 2,000 person army? Looking at the table of organization, you're probably running anywhere between 90 to 110. Are you telling me we cannot get 110 officers? Sure, we can. So we stood at that, and that process remained the same. There is an option that is available. We have the ban. You all know follow up from Liberia. The predominant person who played the ban are from the southeastern region of our country. I mean, it's clear cut. And most of them are not educated. So we agree that, okay, the ban is a part of the AFL, but it's not part of the, uh, the uh, what you call the combat element. And therefore, their rank status is going to be only on the basis of pay. We pay them according to this rank, and that's where it starts. So they do not have a military rank, and they cannot excel into the military because they are strictly members of the band. So the criteria for that is much lower than if you were joining the army as an infantry or a future officer. I think, may I just add to that? I think that's an important element to it. There is a tendency that because people have not had schools for so years, Liberian standards should be dropped down. And I think we are building a new country. International world standards should be the basics. We've got to bring people up, yeah. not put the standard down because people are down. Right. Let's bring them up. And I think that a revisal of that idea is critical. And as we build our country, 
we've got to try to put standards up. Experience, education are critical. Yes. And I think we can't roll the standard because unfortunately we've had a problem. Let's bring the standard up and not go down to, to mediocrity. Yes, good. My name is Joyce Delight. The military is a pet peeve of mine since I did that, since school time. All the girl in our meetings, twice white during the top administration, twice 51. And I went into the military for reasons that you are speaking about, which I'm very impressed. Because Liberians look at the military like they are not human beings. And we need to move over that the military is for um, no cause. No cause. <laughs> we, Wait a minute, no cause. We, I, I, I have no idea no what the meaning of, of no, no, no cause. <laughs> That's not my commission officer. <laughs> okay. And I'm, I'm, I am so impressed because this is something that I'm, I monitor Liberia every day about what's going on in the military. So much that I know some people got some money the other day for some retirement that they're supposed to be getting. And my concern was, how can they, re how can they receive retirement when there was not really all retirement done with the Army? I would say, in order for the peace process and the security to continue in the military. A soldier likes an evening parade. He wants to be honorably discharged. <coughs> a certificate, an evening parade, a handshake will solve a lot of peace in Liberia and no animosity that this people came and threw us out of the military. Because after 30 years being in the military to wake up one morning, you're not young anymore, don't have a job, and you have nothing to depend on, not even a certificate that tells you, thank you, even though we haven't paid you for years, but you were still loyal to the, to the government. I'm talking about the AFL. I'm not speaking about the new people that came in and stuff like this. So, the retirement stuff that it did have in Liberia, it was only a few white men was on the thing, and I can name them. And there were more white there that needed to be officially retired, also old soldiers, okay? So how can they receive retirement money when there has not been any official retirement of the military? That is so important to the peace process of Liberia. And those that I still care about, I did not know that they had the opportunity to go back in the military. That was not <coughs> given to me. So I'm, I'm glad that I got that education today, okay? And uh, what? No, I don't want to go back into the military. I've been go ahead, there, done that. Okay. <laughs> okay. And what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm impressed with, the standard, that is so important to me. Because when I went into the military, I had my family going crazy with me. And I'm like, I don't care what you're saying. I'm going to be in that military to see the truth about the military. And I knew how I got treated was less than human being. And I hope that the new military is not a no call military anymore. They need to be well trained and have a standard that they can have to stay within the military. I congratulated the first lady. I haven't seen her, but I did. I was impressed with her commission and stuff like those. But in terms of, I'm still concerned about the retirement. Okay. How can they receive pension when they have not officially been retired? I'd like to just, uh, we would have rather asked more questions than I asked, but I'd like to take this because it's very important. I want to make the, I want to set the record straight. In 2006, on July 24th, 2006, as part of the National 
uh, July 26th is celebration. The president, who is commander in chief of the Armed Forces of Liberia, and the leadership of the AFL that have already been with, I mean, that received a severance period, hosted a retirement, an official retirement ceremony at the Barclay Training Center, I mean, at the Anthony Tubman Stadium, with all of the generals present, the WACs, lieutenants, all of the officers and men, in a symbolic parade <laughs> with the band went on honorably retiring these persons. The function should have taken place in December of 2005. But because of um, the lack of planning at the time, prior to the coming of the government, the government worked along with the AFL. All of the medals for retirement were ordered from the United States. The certificates were ordered and printed here in the United States. About 5,000 plus certificates and medals were all printed here in the United States and sent to Liberia. They've been taking time to have them signed. On that day, the president received and decorated. We had to get medals in the country to symbolically decorate about 100 of the senior officers and all of the command elements to show the retirement ceremony had taken place on that day. The signing of those certificates have been taking time. To get the president to sit down and sign 5,000 plus certificates is a lot of time, especially if he's doing her original signature and not utilizing stamp. Similarly with the Minister of Defense, I can try my best, you know, to try from time to time to sign, but all of those certificates have been signed and completely been signed so that it will not take another day, an official day, to hand it out to all of them during the July 26th or when the Bureau of Veteran Affairs is finally authorized by the Liberian Senate. But it is a fair question, and I must correct the records, that it be a retirement ceremony. I'm not really documented. Unfortunately, we couldn't guess whether they were alive or dead. So persons who we got the information from the AFL itself, under the leadership of General Pumba Wakona and the, the command and, and general staff, we didn't prepare, they prepared themselves with all of the ranking, all of the years of service, and the list was published of the persons and all of the retirement. They have different medals that will be issued, all of them, for the years of service that they serve. And I must say, yes, we will take care of the new military. We will provide them housing facilities as we are doing right now. We will provide them utilities, including running water and place to wash uh, and shower as well. We will provide them insurance benefit for not only themselves, but also the eligible children who are not above the age of 17, because legally at 18, you are an adult in Liberia. So who are not above the age of 17, and yes, they will have the opportunity to advance themselves educationally. Why? Because that is the background you and I came from, that we expect to of that. And they are being paid, and they've been paid on time, even much faster than the civilian people can take pay. In U.S. dollars. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Yes, Mr. Minister. My name is Alexander Fisher, U.S. Army, Army, Army. Army retiree. Yeah, thank you. Uh, for 60 plus years, I've watched Army personnel in Liberia run around the marketplace with weapons on the shoulder, mm -hmm. 10, 15 uh, rounds in uh, gun, as you said. I don't know how many of you watch, what would you do about disarming the army in the public place? <clears throat> well, I hear making reference outside of the military facility, okay. unless we're going on a military mission. Okay. Yeah, mm. Unless they're on official duties in getting out. And we don't see any reason why, for now, they should be out, in fact, in uniform. Okay. If they're going home, they have to leave their military uniforms in the barracks. Okay. Minister Samuel, my name is Leo Green. And uh, the president in her statement earlier asked the question, I just want to bring it to your attention again. What is the government doing to address the reduction or subsequent uh, departure of Unimil? Because I think we read some time ago that Unimil has begun to re uh, reduce its force. In like you right? subsequently will be departing the country. What is the government doing to prepare itself in the future, especially for those in the interior and all as and in terms of the TRC, because I know our people in the interior, if they hear through a reconciliation is coming, that I means they have to stand before somebody and tell them what actually happened to them. Now without that security and that protection, I doubt if you're gonna get any volunteers to come to the TRC, you know, to to let them know what transpired during the 
The two things the government have drafted what we call a strategic, a strategic response to unmill CDW, which is consolidation, drawdown, and withdrawing. Two, that the Minister of Defense raised the alarm publicly to inform everyone that the government position was that it was too premature for the United Nations to begin to talk about drawdown and withdrawal when they have not assisted us in the completion of the restructuring exercise. And that thirdly, that, it should go, that we should go back to jointly conduct an assessment throughout the country on the security assess capability and what is required for Liberia to be able to take over its own security. So with that in mind, the UN stopped in their tracks, came back and said, oh no, we are not withdrawing. But however, we just wanted to make sure we can begin to plan. So they have a